Well, what's up guys and gals? It's me, Metalman8713 here today. How's it going? I'm here to bring you another video today. Well, I've made an, I've made an, a video this morning after when I got up. It was a vocal cover of This Is The Way To Amarillo. So, yeah, I'm going to be uploading that later tonight. And this video, this video is completely different from that one because I, as promised, I'm here to make part two of my Marillion History video, the band, the progressive rock band. In this one, part two, I'm going to be talking about their period after Fish left. F a, little, a little bit of a recap of what happened when the previous singer left. Fish left the band because... left Marillion in 1988. Well, because, because of the troubles within the band and because their manager... Uh, their, because their manager, it was a long time manager was saved 20% of the band's money that sort of thing um, until they parted with him in 2001 but but then afterwards what did they do where did they go who who to get next da, 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 da. <laughs> but but it's not the end for the band yet because because suddenly in 1989 a former New wave, new wave keyboardist and vocalist from from the band the Europeans, called Steve Hogarth comes into the band. So, um, yeah, I'll see you and see you in in part one of this two part two video in a moment. Right then, you know what? Yep, Steve Hogarth comes into the band. Well, j I'll, but before I move on to the history of Marillion from this point onwards, I'm here, I'll give you a brief overview of Steve Hogarth. Steve Hogarth was born, was born in the late 1950s, in 1959, in, in, may probably, this may be also coincidence, but, but he was born in Kendall in the Lake District where they met Kendall Mincake and then after when he was born in May 1959 and then afterwards he moved off to Donca Doncaster sorry and then he grew up no well then he grew up there and he, he has he has a very different musical background to Fish he came from a new wave music background instead of progressive rock which Fish came from obviously and before he joined Marillion, he was a vocalist with the band called Europeans, not confused with another, which was not confused with another group at the same name, sort of. And uh, But at the same time, when he joined Marillion, he had an offer to join another band called the Da Da on keyboards and possibly occasional vocalist. So... He put, we'll put it this way, he had a offer between joining the most or least hit band in the world. In the end he chose Marillion and then and then then they all became great friends and then they all became great band members afterwards when he joined the band. Well, and, and also in this part of the video I will I'm gonna be talking about the Marillion from nineteen eighty nine up until nineteen ninety nine. The first ten years with Stephen Hogarth at the helm. So um, yep. Well, Steve Hogarth joined, well, joined the band in early 1989, well, but, well, but this was a bit of a, um unusual situation because, well, because the band at the time started recording demos for, for their fifth album, which was called Seasons, Seasons End, which came out later on, later on in the year, here is the cover for it, it came out in September 1989, and the first to feature Steve Hogarth on vocals, but, well, some of the songs which were originally going to appear on season, Season's End, Fish taken with him, took them with him to, to be on his first few soul albums, and, and some of the other songs, the band, re, the band rewritten a few of the songs, and, and, and no, yep, yeah, in the side, retained other songs, and, and, and possibly, but really, after, after recording demos, it was almost finished by the time Hogarth had joined. He, he had two songs which he'd written at the he'd written for the album, which were only written by him. Obviously, it's called Easter and the Space, which 
which Easter came out as a single. I'll tell you about that. And also, it came it came when it came out. It reached number seven on the charts in 1989 when it came out. Number seven. It was their fifth UK number one studio album at the time. And well, and, and also the cover for Seasons End. Let me tell you about this. Instead of the uh, instead of the the album covers, what Mark Wilkinson had. And, well, instead, the the band progressed onto a more photographic, photographic album cover style. Which on Seasons End cover, it has four the four elements on there, which is what the cover was about. It's like you know, well, your earth, water, fire, air. Those that's what the cover represents on there, and well, you know what? Yep. <laughs> and also, you know, the lyrics, and also the lyrics on the album, which, well, it's not like a concept album or anything, but, oh, well, I could tell you right now what a few of those songs are about, you know what, the, oh uh, well, I could say, I could say, you know, the opener, were the, the open song, it's called Kin of the Sunset Town, it was about poverty on there, and, also, it, well, that's what it was. It, it, well, it's, that was what it was originally about, anyway. But Hogarth like modified it, like it modified it, but you know the lyrics to make the song about some square protests in 1989 in China, which whatever was happening at the time over there, and yeah, and well, and what about Easter? Easter is a basically about the troubles in Northern Ireland. I'm going to tell you about the singles. All's right now. The first single was called. The first single released in from the album was called "Hooks in You," which came out in August and it peaked. And it peaked at number thirty. It was the highest charting single from that album. And the first single was Steve Hogarth on there. And so yep. And well, um. Well, instead of mainly progressive rock on that single, like what the band did for Fish in that era, on this on this one, there it has more of like a like a hard rock and pop hard rock style on that one, and it was also Maroon's twelfth consecutive hit on there. It was well, it's basically more straightforward if you want to put it that way. The sun, the sun, and. And Steve Hogarth well, said this about how the song came about. The days were spent jamming in the studio and drinking fresh coffee in the lounge. Next door, on one such afternoon I was wrestling with the cafeteria plunger when I heard that guitar riff coming through a wall. I was pursuing a fax from the ever-creative John Helmer and there was this line, When the fear gets a hooks in you. And then, this, and then, and he said, "That's how the song came about in his head." And then, and then, and then, about an hour, the structure, the structure, and the music for the song came about. And then afterwards, and, well, then afterwards, you know, in there we are at yeah, the song afterwards. And also, there was a music video as well, which I'm going to briefly tell you about. That on the music video, I had like basically shots of a shots of a woman on the cover in a wedding dress very long red nails you know they pull, like pulling away bits of the screen to pull like 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 ripping through paper to reveal the band performing a concert at Brixton Academy down in London which is where it was where that music video was shot at and it sort of alternated between sorry that and that well anyway Hooks in you, he was the cover for it briefly for a few seconds. There we are. And here we are. And the second single was called The Uninvited Guest. He was the cover for it. It came out in it came out in November nineteen eighty nine. It's well, you know well, when Marillion the when Remillion started with Steve Hogarth, they started experimenting with more different styles instead of standard progressive rock which they've been doing up to this point <clears throat> well um 
and the uninvited guest is more straightforward, if you like. And and straightforward rock song and oh and um, it de it debuted outside the top forty. It was, it was the band's first single to fail to chart in the top forty since their debut single Market Square Heroes with Fish. And well yep it charted at number fifty three. And yep. What and the, the lyrics were written by were written by John Helmer, who worked with the band for a very long time, concerning songwriting matters, if you like, and and you know, Helmer said this that the will it will the inspiration for the uninvited uninvited guest was about the disease AIDS epidemic, which was around at the time said it's mainly about the unwanted disturbance of your life i think for me it's about the 70s when i was in my teens there's much sexual freedom everything was free and easy and you could get experience with everything you wanted in the 80s every, everybody was more controlled and careful and it was it was basically the very last straw people were very wary with whom they wanted with whom to share the table in bed people tried to hide from all of it by locking themselves in well, it sort of gave him the like ghostly images for what appeared for the un uninvited guest, and and said this as a matter of fact, it could be you, could also be you at a party, being the person nobody wanted to know. Yep. Well, that's how basically the song came about, and also it went it went to num in the eighties at eighty five at in the Dutch album chart as well in Europe. So, um, yeah, that's quite interesting. And Easter, I've said what that one is about. That song is about the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And Easter's the third single from the album, came out in 1990. 1990, and, yeah, yep. Yeah. And the title is like a reference. It's like a reference to 1916 by William Butler Yeats. And there was a music video filmed for that in the Giants Causeway and also it reached number 34 in the charts as well in 1990 it was the second highest one to chart on there well and then afterwards the band and the, the band went on tour this album to support it before before re, before having a possibly having a little break and reconvening to record their second album with their second album with Steve Hoggarth on there, it was called Holidays in Eden, which came out in 1991, he was the cover for it. It came out in 1991 and it had a very different sort of music style from, sort of different music style from the other one. Well, on them, the band were, on this album were trying to reach a more pop music audience, like the mainstream pop music audience but when it was released the band failed to do that or partly but well well but or in other words it it sort of like you know it failed to get beyond the band's hardcore fan base if you like and it was also Marill Marillion's pop popest album ever actually and it has more of a like a mainstream pop music sound than the other one than the previous albums, I mean, and and this album was produced by Christopher Neal, who worked with with Mike and the Mechanics in the eighties. And Mike Mike was the was the was a member of the band Genesis as well. He well, Mike and the Mechanics is sort of like a side another the other project he does, if you like. Well, he was the cover for it. What it looks like, and it came out in June 1991. That's right. I'll say again, June 1991, and again there were three singles that came out from the album. The first one was called "Cover My Eyes, Pain in Heaven." It came out in May 1991, and it was the lead single from the album. It peaked. It peaked at 34 in the charts, and also it's the band's biggest hit in the Netherlands as well since. Kaylee, do 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 do, well well well. Yep. 
Well, anyway, it reached number 34 in the charts, so, um, yeah, so, yep, yeah, and then afterwards the band released two other singles, No One Can, released in July, and Dryland, which came out in September, which they both, which they both went on the charts at lower positions. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to find that out and tell you guys in part two about that. <sighs> Well, anyway, also, the band released after, after the two two for that album, and, and possibly after another break, the band reconvened, and the, the band came together again, and, and also, for the next album, it took a, a bit of a while for them to record it, but, it took a bit of a while for them to record it, but, and I forgot to say, Holidays in Eden reached number seven in the charts, like the last one and the next album anyway back to that anyway the next album came out in 1994 and that was and that was called Brave and it was the seventh album by the band it was the last album by the band to reach the top 10 top 10 in the charts it w which it peaked at number 10 actually and all and also it was the third album with Steve Hoggoff and the recording process took months to record. About it took about eighteen months to record from nineteen ninety two up until up until late nineteen ninety three afterwards. August nineteen ninety three to be exact. And well well after Holidays in Eden they tried reaching a wider audience but they failed. And well well but Marie and sort of went back to their progressive roots and and this album is a concept album as well actually actually if you like yeah so mm -hmm. and brave brave the concept album well well you know what we're sort of like about a story which the band heard in the press it's based on a new story heard on the radio about a girl which got taken into police custody after after wandering a bridge called the Seven Bridge. That was, and you know, and 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 she possibly had amnesia, and possibly, I mean, she refused the. I mean, she didn't know she didn't know her didn't know her own identity, where she come from, and when they took her to police custody, she refused to give any of that information. Mm hmm Well, anyway, and Hogarth got inspired by this to write a story about the girl who was wandering on that bridge. Well, well, for this album, there were three singles that came out for it: "The Great Escape," "Hollow Man," and "Alone Again in the Lap of Luxury." That "The Great Escape" came out in early January. 94, The Hollow Man in March, and Alone Again in the Lap of Luxury in April, which, you know, don't me up. And it was also their penultimate album on their contract with EMI because, I'll tell you in just a second, that their, ne that, well, that their next one is the last one which they did for EMI. And, and also, ah, there we go. Sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Just a bit of for them went went down the wrong way. <laughs> well, anyway, the 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 songs "No One Can" and "Dryland" reached 33 and 34 in the charts when they came out in '91, and "Sympathy," which were and which which was a single from their a singles collection album, which came out the next year. It's a compilation of all their Singles which came out like, up to that time reached number 17 on the charts and there was a reissue of No One Can which came out as well the following year and it reached number 26. The Great Escape failed to chart in the UK. The Hollow Man at 30 and Alone Again in the Lap of Luxury at 53. Well anyway, anyway now we move on to Afraid, afraid of sunlight. 
<laughs> afraid of sunlight. Well, vampires are actually afraid of sunlight. Afraid of Sunlight is the eighth album by Marillion, and it was their last for EMI. It came out in 1995, and really, and, and when that album came out, it failed to reach the top ten. It reached number 16. It reached number 16, and also, it was one of their most, their last re very crit critically acclaimed album until 2004, which they released in the form of something called Marbles. Yep. And, yep. and before I talk about the album, they released two singles for it, Beautiful, it, it charted at 29, and Cannibal Surf Babe, it's only a US single, which probably failed to chart. Well, you know, and Afraid of Sunlight is another concept album, it's about, you know, the, it's about the, you know, I think it's about celeb, like, the just sort, sort of like, destructive side of celebrity, of this, of celebrity and fame, you know, yep, which so, and there's a few songs on there which, and, the, and there's also a few songs on there which highlight it, you know, it's refer, referring to a few, it's referring to destructive thrill seekers like, you know, James Dean, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, when he had his accident in the 50s. Out of This World is about Donald Campbell, which, which, wait, about when he died in 67, and also... And Gaz Paucho is a song about Mike Tyson. And sorry about that, it's a, sorry about that, my camera went off for a moment. Well, anyway, there was a song on Afraid of Sunlight called Kin, which refers to... Very famous musicians, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, people like that, Kurt Cobain, and yep, and I forgot to say, Gaz Paltrow, it's sort of like, uh, satirical, like, you know, and, and, and also song, and the lampoons, the hot lampoons, the Hollywood lifestyle, if you like. Well, anyway, that's a bit about the album for you, and also... And also, there was a son, and, and there's also, well, and, and all, uh, well, also, you know, they found the, the album on there, on, uh, on the, a good album when it came out, like the press, and, well, also, it's their last three of my, because also, the following year, the, a live album came out also, which was there, which, which, which was recorded on the, on the Brave and Holders in Eden tours in 91, 92, 94, 95. And also a compilation album came out called The Best of Both Worlds, which which had all the singles from Marillion's 15 year career up to that point. And so, yep, well, anyway, with no record deal, they signed to a new label called, they signed to a label at the time, Castle Records, which was a rock and metal label in this country. It on t like for 20 odd years, 21 years in fact, and also they signed a three album deal with them. Well, um, the first album that they released was called This Strange Engine, and it came out in early 1997, he was the cover for it right now, and there's a song on there which, which is like a fictional biography of, a fictional biography of Steve Hoggoff, and you know what, the live album, it was called Made Again, the live album, it came out in February, March, February, March 1996. The Strange Ending, one of the songs was a fictional, a, f a fictional account of the sinner Steve Hoggoff's life, yep, and well, you know what, I don't know what, at that time, also Marillion found themselves struggling to find a place in the music business at the time, as well. Some, yep. And then afterwards, they released a new, another album called Radiation in 1998. It was their tenth studio album. The Strange Engine was their ninth, and also, well, it was well received by fans, but it got a mixed reception. And then, the third album, Marillion.com, 
came out in late 1999. There's a few song, a few songs on that album were described as some of the band's worst, worst sort of you know songs, if you like. And here are the covers for this strange ending, Radiation, and Marillion.com. And I, I did forget to mention a, f a few of them have, have been remastered so far as well. Yeah. And also, later on, at the time, and also they ch had their music style, well the band's music style at, the, at this time was also, you know, became more like pop, Is this, they had music styles which they experimented with also, apart from aggressive pop rock, art rock, you know, they had, some of their albums from the late 90s onwards had a bit more of a and then also they started also incorporating alternative rock trip hop influences in there in the late 90s and then they went to a more like radiohead sort of sound well if you want to put it that way but, but, but not in the sort of that style which they do but sort of like one which they make it their own and maroon.com you know and well you know well, well you know it was self-produced and there was no singles from it, but you know, there was one song, and there was one song on there called House. It had a trip hop influence, and someone, and there's, and what really it's their least popular work, if you like. And there's one song on there called Built in Something Radar, which was which was one of their worst songs of all time. Well, anyway, also at the time, the band didn't really have didn't really have enough money to tour the US but luckily the internet was so was slowly developing at the time and and in part two this would be what the history which I tell you about them is vital about the internet and Beryllion is vital to the band's existence in these later years well also to tour the US back to that they were asked their fans to Ask their fans to give them enough money to to come and tour the US, their dedicated fan base, if you like. Well, the fans had funded it. It's called, you know, crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And well, anyway, in part two, I'm going to be telling you about the band's history from from the next album, which was Anarachophobia, and their great use of the internet, which you know, helped them help there you know, which will really help them in the 2000s and beyond well anyway i'll see you guys in part two and and you know yep i'll probably name this one history marillion part two steve hogger 1989-1999 if you like so yep i'll see you guys in part two don't go anywhere and also wednesday i'll be doing my stokesy fair video don't forget don't forget to check that out as well i'll see you in part two